Aloha. This Traditions of the Pacific lecture is titled The Land of Ma'amai Kahiki, Ancient Hawaiian Life in the Kua'aina of Kahiki Nui Maui, presented by Patrick B. Kirch. This lecture was recorded on Friday, May 2, 2014. Aloha mai kako. That was a very nice Victoria with too many stories there. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here uh, and an honor in Hawaiian Hall. As um, <clears throat> Victoria mentioned, I got this early start, uh, 13 years old, with the Malacology Department here at Bishop Museum. <clears throat> and my dad, Roland Force, who was the director, came out to the <clears throat> East Honolulu Rotary Club, and he was talking. My dad went up and said, hey, what do you got for a precocious 13-year-old? So that's how I started. And <clears throat> before I get into the lecture, I just wanted to mention that it's so wonderful to see so many supporters of the museum and you know your, the membership, which I know many of you belong to, is so important uh, in helping to support the institution and programs like this and lectures and so on. So, uh, if you're not a museum member, you know, <clears throat> join. And uh, if you are, mahalo for your support of the museum. It was obviously instrumental in launching me on my career so many years ago, and I hope there are <clears throat> other young keiki you know, coming along in the islands who are getting that kind of uh, inspiration. So my my talk tonight. Um, is about this place on Maui that I'll get into, and I just published a book about it. And uh, of course, they've got copies here. You can buy one tonight if you want. But it's called Kua Aina Kahiko, the ancient backlands. You could translate that, life and land in, in Kahiki Nui, uh, Maui, published by University of Hawaii Press. I want to start with two quotes. I won't have a lot of quotes here, <clears throat> but um, Kahiki Nui is a place that is not well known in the written. Uh, accounts, the written Molelo, the traditions, very few references to it, but a couple that do exist are very interesting, almost kind of chicken skin. Uh, this one from Samuel Kamakao's The Coming of the Gods uh, talks about the Molelo of Kane and Kanaloa uh, who came to Maui and, as it says, <coughs> opened the waters, um, <coughs> the fish pond, uh, Kanaloa at Lua Lailua, a place in Kahikinui, and from there the water of Ko at Kaupo, reference perhaps to some of the very early voyagers from Tahiti coming here and arriving at Kahiki Nui. And I took my title in particular from this, um, <coughs> from Fornander's famous collection of Hawaiian antiquities, 1916, where Fornander refers to this famous uh, individual who voyaged from Kahiki, La'amai Kahiki, La'a from Kahiki, who was an <coughs> offspring of Moikeha when Moikeha went down to uh, Tahiti and lived for a time and had this keiki with a Tahitian chiefess and then went back to Kauai and later sent his son, Kila, to fetch Laamai Kahiki and bring him to see his father in Kauai. And they voyaged back from Tahiti, uh, went to Kauai where he dwelt for a time, then to Oahu. And then as you see in the quote, Laamai Kahiki went, it says, <coughs> he went and dwelt for a time in Kahikinui but he found the place too windy. And if anybody knows Kahiki, no, it's a very windy place. Uh, and then he went to Kaolavi, and he returned then to Kahiki. And of course, the road, or the, the route from uh, Kaolavi is known as Kealai Kahiki, the road to Kahiki, which Laamai Kahiki followed. So Kahiki Nui, and there you have an image of it looking eastwards, um, <coughs> literally means Tahiti Nui, Great Tahiti, right? And if you look at the island of Maui, I may have that next here. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the island of Tahiti and the Society Islands, it looks just like this, two volcanoes. So if it's flipped, and the big side of Tahiti Nui is like this and the little side there. But it is a double volcano, just like Maui. And the big part of uh, Tahiti then is called Tahiti Nui. And so at some point, it seems that when voyagers came up from Tahiti to the Hawaiian Islands, they may have been approaching like this, in their canoes, and they saw this great mountain, and they said, ah, Tahiti Nui, Kahiki Nui. They named that part of Maui for the homeland. This is something that Polynesians did over and over again, transferring the names of ancient homelands to the new islands. As you know, Hawaii itself is the, uh, <coughs> the name for the ancient homeland. Hawaiiki is Hawaii, and so this is another transference. For those of you not familiar then, Kahiki Nui, shown here, is one of the six ancient uh, Mokur districts of Eastern Maui, there's another six in Western Maui. Maui had 12 ancient Mokuor districts, and this was one of them. Um, here I've shown you some of the major place names in Kahikinui. 
Uh, some of these probably had ahupua'a status. Some may have just been ili. The land system there is not well understood because it became government land right at the time of the Mahele, and so then the Land Boundary Commission skipped over it. And uh, I, I could talk more about that, but I won't go into a lot of details. But we have some major place names that we know through Kaiki Nui, and, um, but there probably were many more that are lost. So this place, a lava landscape, as I say here, um, Kaiki Nui is in the rain shadow of Haleakala, and is a very dry land. It's an Aina Malo'o. Um, it gets its rain only primarily in the winter months when the Kona rains uh, come in. Some years it gets almost no rain. Some years it might get five, six Kona rainstorms. But otherwise, there's very little rainfall in Kaiki Nui. But there was just enough in the upland zones to grow uala, sweet potato. And so when the famous <coughs> uh, Bishop Museum ethnologist Edward Handy went through the islands in the 1930s, uh, he went through Kahikino. He was abandoned by then. No one lived there. But old people in Kaupo and in uh, Kanayo to either side uh, told him that people used to plant sweet potato. And so, as he noted in his book, all the lands from Kaupo through Kahikinui to Honua Ula and Kula made up, quote, the greatest continuous dry planting area in the Hawaiian Islands. So it was once a major, major place of dry land agriculture. The geology, here's Kahikinui on Maui, is um, quite interesting because the eastern half of Kahiki Nui consists of fairly older lava flows, about 200, 250,000 years old, a bit more weathered. And the western part, uh, you see here, this map of these lava flows, uh, some of them are quite young, as young as 3,000 years, and many of them in sort of 10, 20,000 year range. And that greatly affected the way in which people lived on the Aina, um, these very young lava. Uh, landscape. So here we have a, a picture of the western part of Kahiki Nui, this undulating a'a ah -ah lava flow is still pretty fresh. And when you get to the eastern part of the Aina, you begin to get these gulches. The 200,000 year old landscapes are old enough that the intermittent streams from the Kona Rains have worn down these gulches, but they don't flow most of the time. They're dry gulches except when you get the Kona Rains. And the vegetation of Kaiki Nui, it's of course been greatly affected by goats and cattle and all of these <coughs> uh, European introduced things, but it was uh, classically an area of dry forest, of native dry forest, and parts of it still retain beautiful dry forest vegetation. And probably the most uh, characteristic tree of Kaiki Nui, at least in the middle elevation zones, is the Willy Willy. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Willy Willy tree, uh, this deciduous tree, so it loses its leaves. So, uh, in the winter months, kind of rare in Hawaii to have deciduous trees, but it does, and then it flowers when it doesn't have leaves, and has these beautiful seeds as well. And um, you know, in Kavana Pukui's <coughs> book of Hawaiian proverbs, she has this wonderful uh, proverb: "Pua ka willy willy, nana hu ka mano." When the willy willy blooms, the sharks bite. And I pondered this for a long time, and then <coughs> I, I think what it actually refers to, at least one possible. Uh, meaning of this, one kauna of this, is that in these dryland, these uh, uala cultivation zones, <coughs> the willy blooms right at the end of the sweet potato growing season, when the harvest is ripe, right, and all the tubers. And that is, of course, when the chiefs would come to collect the whole kupu at the makahiki. So you better have your offerings or whole kupu ready, or because, of course, ali'i are also known as mano, as sharks. You, they might bite if you don't have uh, what they want. Now, the archaeological study of Kaiki Nui, as Victoria mentioned, uh, when I was 16 years old and I got involved here with Bishop Museum, <coughs> the museum, Kenneth Emery, sent Peter Chapman here, who was a doctoral student at Stanford, but from an old island family. Uh, Kenneth said, well, <coughs> Peter, you go out there to Kaiki Nui for a couple of months and do a settlement pattern survey. It was kind of a new thing. Uh, record all of the sites out there. So Peter said, right, he was going to be his PhD thesis at Stanford and got together a team of volunteers, <coughs> of which I was one. Um, several others, Joan Pratt from a Punahou teacher and uh, <coughs> a couple of other people. And we shipped the museum's old Jeep out there and uh, we did this for several months in the summer of 66. So that's me and somebody was talking about Pila Kikuchi tonight. There's Pila Kikuchi standing next to me. And we mapped 500 archaeological sites in Kaiki Nui that summer. 
Um, so that's me with the plane table and validated mapping. There's uh, Peter, and I think, and somebody else. And again, our field team, that's me on the end. So 1966, but Peter never finished writing this up. He never wrote his doctoral dissertation at Stanford. He, he became ill, and he worked with the data for a long time, but never finished it. So it was put aside. And after he passed away, I was still here at Bishop Museum, and uh, his widow, Betsy, turned over his unfinished notes of his dissertation things to me. I kept them for a long, long time, thinking someday I'll go back. And in the uh, spring, I think it was of 1993, so I was back in the islands with my wife, Therese, who's there, and we were doing this book photographing archaeological sites of the islands. I said, let's go see Kaikinui. We've got to go back and see what Kaikinui's like. And we arrive, and what do I see? But these images we took that day, so there was an old uh, church ruin you see here, the Santa Inez Church. The Kikinui people have been Catholics in the 1830s. Uh, you know, you weren't supposed to be a Catholic in the 1830s in Hawaii. You had to be a good Protestant, uh, and the Catholics were not allowed. There was a lot of problem with religious freedom until the late 1840s when Kamehameha III finally allowed you know, religious freedom. And, but the Kikinui people had been <coughs> Catholics, and they had built this chapel, Santa Inez. And you see with, with coral lime mortar, and, and it would have had a peely grass roof over it originally. And we had found the ruins of this and mapped it. Well, the reason I show up and somebody has put a plywood roof over this thing and hung a sign saying, Kauhana o Kaikinui, the family of Kaikinui. And they're flying the Hawaiian flag and the United Nations flags both upside down as distress symbols. And, you know, well, this is, of course, part of, you know, in the 90s there was <coughs> great interest in sovereignty here in Hawaii and a lot of interest in getting back Hawaiian lands and so on. So anyway, we stopped. And we... Um, <coughs> We saw, we met this woman, um, Kawai Pilani Paikai, who was a member of Kaohana. We started talking to her, and I tell the story in my book. And she thought we were a couple of tourists, came up in the Jeep, we were on our way to Hana, you know, and she invited us in, and she starts telling us about all the struggles for the land. And see, Kahikinui was Hawaiian homeland, still is, so all Hawaiian homelands, but had never been given over to Hawaiians. It was leased for cattle ranching, see. So this group had gotten together and said, we don't want the lease to be continued for ranching. We want to get back on the island. She tells all this story, and, you know, she's saying, and she gestures up there. We're sitting there. She says, you know, on these lands up here, there once were, you know, thousands of Hawaiians living here. And I looked at her, and I said, I know, because I have a map that has 550 archaeological sites up there. And she looked at me, and she goes, who are you? <laughs> so we talked some more. And she said, you have to come back and help us and share this. And I said, you're right. The time has come. Uh, and so in 95, it took a little while. I had to negotiate with Hawaiian Homes and get permission and all that. But in 95, we started. And for 17 years, then, I continued working in Kaikinui, uh, doing this archaeological work. And Mo Moeller, if any of you know him, <coughs> um, became the president of Kaohana Kaikinui, a very charismatic man and uh, is living out there now. They did eventually get their leases, 99-year leases from Hawaiian Homes, 20-acre off-grid uh, homes, and several families are, are living there. So uh, one of the things that's been great in this work is to <coughs> actually have this collaboration uh, with Kaohano Kaikinui. So as I say, I, <coughs> I've worked there uh, for many years now, uh, more intensively in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, with support from the National Science Foundation. And we map big areas, not the whole thing, but three big zones. Those are all archaeological sites you see there. And just some scenes of the kind of field work. This is uh, <coughs> Donna Sterling, one of the Ohana members, and my student, Kathy Covello, Native Hawaiian student from Keokaha, the Big Island, and other members. There's also Solomon Kaidehiva, another Native Hawaiian student from Berkeley I took out there, and my other students. And uh, just a few scenes. This is Again, Mo Moeller of Kaohana with Kali Watson, some of you might know, who was at the time the chairman of the Hawaiian Homes Commission, and it was the first visit they got Hawaiian Homes commissioners out there to see the place, and we toured them you know, around, and Mo shoved Kali into my Jeep. I said, well, you giving the chairman of my Jeep, you know, you should be taking him. But he told me later, he says, you know, bro, because you like to talk about heiau and house sites and stuff so much, I knew when you got Kali in your Jeep, you're going to talk, 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 talk. Hey, over here, hey, over there, house side on top of the ridge, hey, out on there. And you, Kali been telling us that the Hawaiians never lived out here, but you're going to convince him that they did. So I was set up by Mo, and I think I did wear Kali down a little bit. Uh, and here we are cooking, you know, we used to spend weekends with the Ohana, there's me mapping. 
And we even had in places, uh, <coughs> Paul Custone, some of you might know, brought out his hulua sled, and we were actually hulua down the uh, pu'u at Ulapalakua. I went down right after Sharon and wiped out my one and only time on a hulua sled. Never again. I'm too old for that. Um, so anyway, as I say, we, over the years, surveyed about 12 square kilometers of Kaikinui, big stretches here and here. The many areas still remain to be done. I'm leaving that for the next generation, but uh, we did a lot of work. Let me just briefly speak about the chronology. So based on all the latest radiocarbon dating, it looks like Polynesians came up from the Marquesas and Tahiti around AD 1000, more or less. Um, they didn't began to settle Kahikinui area, the dry lands, until about four centuries later. Um, Kahikinui is a very dry land. It's not the first place you'd want to go to live. So they would settle into Oahu and Kauai and uh, maybe parts of West Maui. But we do have an interesting hint of this early voyaging period. So there is this site, very remote part of Kahikinui, um, the Panana, the sighting wall at, at Hanamaloa, um, which is at the southernmost tip of uh, Kahikinui, southernmost tip of Maui, faces out to the channel of Kealai Kahiki, the road to Tahiti. It's this very strange wall with a notch in it. That The notch lines up to an ahu. And I'll show you what that's pointing to in just a second. But when I was out there in the 90s, the fellow you see in the other slide, the Reverend uh, Kabika Kaalakea, now passed away. But I met him there right at the time that photo was taken. And he said, you, do you know this this site, this notch wall. I said, yeah, I've seen it, but I don't know what it is. Nobody knows. He says, pa na na, yo na na go kahiki. He, he repeated this to me several times. And then, of course, I found this molelo of la mai kahiki. And so I've come to believe that this is actually some kind of memorial to la mai kahiki and that connection because we've analyzed it in detail, published this recently in the Journal of the Polynesian Society. When you cite... Uh, through, there's actually Ahu in an upright stone, this little complex, but you side through this, there is the Southern Cross, upright, and that is, of course, the marker star to voyage to Kahiki, right? So this, I think, is a very important site, and we were able to date some branch coral that's around the Ahu, was set there as offerings, and it comes out around 1400 AD, that is the end of the voyaging period, so. Uh, but most of the radiocarbon dates from Kahiki Nui uh, are after that, so we, th we have a few very early ones, but then this is um, frequencies of radiocarbon dates. Sorry, the, the ages are not showing well, but this is in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, then boom, 1700s. It was really packed with people by the 1700s, and then, of course, we get the collapse that happens after, you know, Western contact and uh, introduction of disease and so on. But what about life on, uh, you know, living on lava in this lava landscape? Well, it was a difficult place to adapt to. Um, many of the Polynesian crops, like ulu, breadfruit, um, would not grow well in Kaikinui, too dry, too windy. So the main crop, um, well, I'll get to the crops in a minute, um, but the main zone that they were living in was kind of here in the uplands. So you can see the denser concentration of sites. It's got a scattered site, some on the coast fishing, then you get kind of a barren zone, and then you get a denser zone up and around between, say, 1,200 to about 26, 2,800 feet elevation above sea level. So not a, a heavy coastal occupation here. And the coast is cliffs and rough and sea waves crashing in and just little bays and coves here and there where you can get down and get opihi or put your little canoe out for fishing. Um, and so, again, if we plot here the numbers of house sites by elevation above sea level, it's in meters here, but you can see this big curve. This is a dense area, and then it drops off again. So it's around, you know, like I say, 1,500, 2,000 feet elevation. That's where people were living in Kahikinui, not down on the coast. Too hot. You cannot grow anything down there. They go down to fish, but then go back up uh, into the uplands. And when we look at the uh, sites by the different lava flows, which we've done here, we also see that the younger, relatively younger, western part of Kahikinui actually was more densely packed with house sites and with heiau. You might think when you drive through, uh, it looks nicer in the east because the older landscape is a little more weathered soil, but the problem there is that when you get to 
couple hundred thousand year old lava there, it's leached out of many of the soil nutrients. So it's actually better to farm on the rock, so to speak, Yorawala, than it is um, <coughs> on the older soils. Water was a big problem in Kaikinui because you don't have flowing streams. We think there was more water in the past. We've done some studies on this. When the forest came lower down the slopes of Haleakala with fog drip, in fact, fog drip was probably more important than the rains. It probably raised the water table, and we have evidence of little springs and seeps and things that have now dried up. But there were never flowing you know, rivers in Kaikinui. But where there were these little seeps and springs, guess what? We find petroglyphs. And there were almost no petroglyphs known in the district before we started. We now have quite a number of petroglyph sites, like here. Mostly at these places, there was probably a water seep under this cliff here. And here's Sissel Millerstrom recording uh, petroglyphs. And here are some of the images. And they're mostly all small groups of human figures, called anthropomorphs. And we think they were probably marking family groups, family water sources. This is my vi, this is my place to go and get water, my family group. Um, at least that's the hypothesis that we have. So farming the rock, um, their agriculture. Again, dry. This is a chart of rainfall from <coughs> um, three areas around Kahikinui, Oahis, in Kahikinui, Ulupalaku, Waipo. Just want to show you the fluctuations by year. You can see, you know, some years quite wet, like here. Other years very dry. So it's a fluctuation. But this red line across is kind of the lower limit for growing uala. It's about 750 millimeters of rain per year. So it's a tough place. You know, some years you you okay, you got a nice crop, but some years you're going to be in pretty rough conditions to try to eke out um, a crop of uala. And uala was, according to the uh, what, for example, Handy was told by the old timers in the 1930s that was the main crop. I think it was also dryland uh, taro, kalo, but we were pretty sure there was. But sweet potato, because it um, you know, was domesticated actually in Peru and brought by Polynesians from Peru into Polynesia, that's a whole other long story, but because it was domesticated in the arid and colder uplands of the Andes, it's suited to places like Kaikinui. So it's a very good crop. Um, and we have lots of archaeological evidence of growing uala in the form of the actual the tubers that uh, when they get dropped into the fire sometimes they will carbonize like charcoal and we can uh, thin section them in the laboratory and they still preserve their anatomy and we can identify them as they're distinctively sweet potatoes. So you see the tuber sections and then the anatomical uh, details there. And many sites, <coughs> uh, garden sites, in the uplands of Kaikinui that we have studied. Uh, here, so you have this landscape of undulating a'a lava flows. And in the depressions or the swales of these a'a flows, like here, this is where they were farming. So they would put the house sites up on the ridges, where it's drier and rockier, and preserve the depressions for farming. And in these we find terraces and remains of agricultural activity, even emu like this, which was probably a ritual emu of the kind Kamakao describes. Um, and these swales, even today, they always stay greener, lusher, as things dry up in the summer months. So you can see why people would put their uala down in these. And it's protected from the wind, which really blasts through Kahikinui. So here's another swale that we mapped in detail. Uh, and each of these kind of blobs that you're seeing is a little rocky mound where they would plant uh, uala around this, right? And the mounds are also probably moisture preserving, mulching uh, features. Um, <coughs> some of these lava flows, like this one in white, are just the right age uh, to really have enough soil nutrient, but just old enough. So you can, they have more workability. They're about 50,000 years old, full of evidence of cultivation. And these are all heiau sites surrounding those, so probably agricultural heiau, heiau uluai, surrounding these cultivation zones. And in some cases, we even found, this is a site called DLD, and you wonder, <coughs> you know, these archaeologists, they always have these systems for naming sites, so DLD, well, that must mean something very precise. It means Donna and Leon's driveway. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so you know. Leon came down with a bulldozer and cut, this is after they got the leases from Hawaiian Homes and cut that nice driveway. And we were working nearby 
you know, on the side, and Dollar comes down on her quad and says, well, you guys looking for charcoal? Come up over here because, you know, we just cut the driveway and all these emu features and things showing, so we got to drive up there. And what we found in this tephra, a very unique kind of geology, um, we could find all the OO digging stick depressions actually preserved. I mean, they cut into the ashy uh, tephra, and it was a wonderful site, and there were emu there and all kinds of evidence of intensive gardening cultivation. Um, daily life in Kahikinui is reflected in the, uh, the house sites, <coughs> the kauhale, the complex of, of houses, which were the dwellings of the, uh, the makainana, the common people. As many of you may know, in traditional Hawaiian society, you didn't have a single hale. You had several hale in a kauhale, a group of hale cluster. So you had your hale noa, the common house where men and women could uh, sleep together, reside together, but you had a separate mua house for the men to eat together and perform rituals and separate eating area for the women and separate cookhouses. And this is what we find. Uh, many, many hundreds of these habitation sites. Here's just one that I mapped. So you have a main dwelling and then these subsidiary kinds of structures, cookhouses, and, and so on. And when we began working on these and doing some excavations, some interesting patterns uh, began to be revealed uh, this is um, his excavations in what is probably a mua, a men's house, on top of a, a ridge that has several clusters going down. Strong windbreak wall to the east. Most of these sites are marked by these. There would have probably then been a lean-to thatched house over this. Could even have been open on this side. Uh, and a number of small hearths uh, within that <coughs> uh, structure. So here's the map. You have the windbreak wall and various cooking hearth features within. But what's really interesting, right in the corner, the house would have stood like this, was this niche um, carefully made in the corner, and in it were two water-worn pebbles, two ili-ili stones. And I think that this was a, a shrine of some kind. Um, if you read David Malo's Hawaiian Antiquities, he talks about the heiau in the mua, right, within the man's house where this is just in, in commoner households, where offerings were made to the Almakua of the family on a daily, daily basis. And I think that this niche, those two stones may have been re representing the, the ancestral uh, founders of this family. And it might have been where the ipu that Malo and Kamakao talk about might have been hung over this with the daily offerings and so on. Uh, very interesting. And we have some other examples like this. And then just down slope was this <coughs> larger site, which is probably the Halinoa for the complex. And here uh, we had two, you see one here right next to it, parallel, these beautiful stone-lined kind of firebox hearths. They're not imu, they're not deep imu pits, but they're cooking features, I think, for the reheating of food. So you would cook initially in the imu, but then you, know, you don't want to make an imu necessarily every day, so you want to reheat food. And they had to respect the aikapu, the gender differentiation between men and uh, women's food. But here they seem to be doing it within a single house. So you've got two side-by-side -side, um, hearth features. And we got this at several sites. So here's another one. One hearth here, one hearth here. And so this um, showed us you know, some patterns that are not necessarily in the classic books you read about Hawaiian society, where, for example, Malo... You know, where he says every, there has to be separate emu in cooking houses for the men and the women and so on. But what he's talking about there is the, you know, the, the proper people, the ali'i and people who resided near them and so on. So at the end of his text, he has this quote I've always loved. He says, well, this is the way proper people did things. But, you know, out in the Kua'aina, in the backlands, he says, if you can't read it in the back, he says, only the people, the Kua'aina folks, only cared for a little shanty the fireplace was close to their head and the poi dish conveniently at hand. And so with but one house, they made shift to get along. So I think we are seeing in Keikinui some of these patterns of the, the back people, right, who weren't so, care quite so much about the niceties of all the aikapu and everything, you know, that went on, say, in, uh, you know, Wailuku area or something like that. Um, we, a very, very interesting site that we worked on is, was almost certainly the house complex of a kahuna a priest because it sits in close association with a cluster of heiau that I'll show you later, um, the only house near there. And the only person who's going to live in the middle of a group of heiau would be a kahuna, I'm pretty sure. 
And this is a well-built site, big terrace, a nice high wall enclosing house. We found the hearth there. Um, lots of evidence for woodworking with fine adzes, probably sculpting of images. Uh, and one interesting find was a lava stalactite drip that comes out of a, a lava tube cave. So this priest may have actually visited up either in Halakala Crater or maybe gone to the Big Island where these features exist. Um, but they don't exist in Kaiginui. And uh, some of the adzes, the woodworking tools, was we did a <coughs> what we call an XRF analysis, X-ray fluorescence, where we can determine the origin. So he was getting adzes from the Big Island of Hawaii from Lanai and as far as Oahu. So this guy had connections all across several islands. Um, other sites, like down here at Oahu, are probably Ali'i dwellings or the Konohiki for Ali'i who may not have resided um, in the district. Much larger terraces, big uh, walled terraces, and there's the Hale uh, there. And <coughs> there's a lot of evidence of ritual life in uh, Kahiki, Kahiki Nui. Um, some heiau were known from Winslow Walker's 1929. Very quick, Walker spent one, two days on a horse with a couple of informants from Kaupo riding through, and they showed him, I think, about 15 heiau or so. But we have discovered many, many more. We now have about 60 sites that we believe to be heiau of one kind or another. Um, again, many of them in the upland zone associated with the agricultural features and the dense house sites. And along the coast, we have others. Many of them are fishing shrines or, or koa. I'll show you some <coughs> pictures of some of these temples. Uh, the plot just shows a big size variation in them. But this one, for example, I'm, I'm sitting, standing on a temple platform. It's an open platform. You see the two uprights, um, which are probably um, <coughs> marking or representing uh, a koa or de deities of some kind. This one is oriented to the northeast, very important orientation. And if you sit, if you had a La Hala mat, you're sitting here, framed between the uprights, this is a natural boulder with a real sharp point on it, as you see. And right there is where Makali'i, the Pleiades star cluster, would rise at the, what we call the achronitic setting. That is, when it rises exactly opposite the sunset, which is what represents the oncoming of the Makahiki season. Right? And over and over, we have found these kinds of precise associations uh, with these, these temples. It's something, again, that has really uh, come out of the Kaiki Nui work that was not known before. This one here, big terrace platform, um, I believe actually to be a kahua, a dance platform for hula performance. We have two of these. Uh, I'm going to all the evidence why I think that is. but. Um, it's almost, it's set up like a kind of stage where everything that took place on it would be visible from a wide area around it and with a pu'u behind it which would resonate if you had the pahu there. Um, the, uh, let's see, click, there we go. So <clears throat> there are different types of heiau in Kahiki Nui in terms of the formal construction. The most common, most frequent is uh, something that we call a notched heiau. Walker coined that term. It, it, he did this because it, these sites all have, if you think of a uh, rectangle or square, they have a notch taken out. So instead of four sides, they've got six sides. All right, that's what he means by a notch tail. Um, they often have two kind of rooms like this. There's a sketch plan. I made a very small little one in Oahe. Here you can see a notched one um, down <coughs> the real lava landscape down at Elena. Here's one from a helicopter shot of another notch tail. Um, this one, again, if you sit right in here and you look this way, there's another um, pohaku that, again, points exactly to the rising of Makali'i of Pleiades. <coughs> there's another type that I call the double court elongated form. Uh, here you see, um, this is, again, a helicopter shot of, you see, like, two courts, one here and one here offset. And this one faces, by the way, exactly, precisely due east. These walls are within one degree of variance of true east. Uh, so whoever was, the kahuna who were laying these out knew what they were doing, I mean, in terms of astronomical phenomena. Um, this is one that's uh, oriented north to Haleakala, very interesting. Some of these are, seem to be oriented to me to, there's some very prominent red pu'u on the skyline of Haleakala, and red, of course, being a color associated with ku, um, they may be temples uh, that were dedicated to Ku, is possible. 
This is the largest heiau known in Kahikinui. It was not shown to Walker. He didn't see it. Um, it. It's the biggest in terms of overall plan. You see it here from a helicopter shot, and here's my map. And it's a double notched. So we have one heiau that has a notch, and then to the east is like a mirror, not a mirror, but a, a, a enlarged version of it. And I think that this is the older one, and it must have been successful in terms of the prayers that were offered there, offerings, whatever, and um, I think they decided to then replicate it bigger at a later point in time. So there's like an offering niche here, and there's an offering niche here. And notice this very prominent, it's not squared, it comes as very prominent point, which I call a canoe prow. Uh, and we have a number of these temples in Kaiki Nui that have these canoe prow points. And they point right to the big island, which is very interesting. I think it was purposeful and symbolic, and you probably know there was a lot. Of, there was both interaction with the big island, um, but there was also warfare going on back and forth between Maui and, and Hawaii at that time. Uh, this one I talk about in the book. I, I talk about experience there. I've tried to write this book in terms of many of the stories and things of, of our field work, not just the sort of dry scientific account. And one of the times I went up here early on was with Kale Suha. Some of you may know her. Uh, she was taking a group of Kamehameha Schools uh, kids up there, asked me to lead a tour. So we walked up early one morning, and I showed them there's a special stairway. You walk up. We were standing here, and <coughs> Kale did a, a pule. And as we finished, as the pule finished, and we sort of opened our eyes, and I looked up, there were two um, white tailed tropics right overhead flying. It still kind of gives me chicken skin thinking about it. And, you know, Kalei said, ah, she just kind of smiled and said the kinolao of ku, you know, one of the representations of, of ku. Um, and on the coast, we have <coughs> many fishing shrines or koa. These are very small enclosures, often with no obvious entrance. You had to climb up over the wall to get in. Mm, but they're marked by usually these uh, water-worn upright stones, which represent Ku'ula, the deity of fishermen, and had a lot of branch coral offerings uh, around them. Now, I mentioned there's this cluster of heiau in the uplands of Naka'ohu, in the center of, of Kaikinui district. Um, this is where the priest's house was located. So here's the priest's house. And we have a heiau here, another one here, what's probably an oven house here, another heiau here, another one here maybe a small shrine, and some big areas that are leveled, which I think were assembly areas for people to come and be seated while certain ceremonies were taking place. The interesting thing is that these, the heiau cluster here, they have different orientations. Uh, there's only one priest's house, and they all date to a similar period. I think it's kind of like an Acropolis. So you, you know, you've, the Acropolis at Athens, where there were many temples to different gods, right? I think it was a sim similar kind of place in the center of Kaiki Nui where there were multiple temples, two different deities where probably r different rites took place at different times of the year. Uh, this, is, this wall, a very low wall, it's not a cattle wall, anything like that, wouldn't keep any animals out, but it may have been defining a kapu zone uh, where people were not supposed to uh, transgress. This is an aerial photo um, of it, and you can see here the priest's house, and then this big square temple, the oven house, there's another temple here. So when I began working on all these heiau in the 1990s and mapping them, uh, it began to, I began to realize that these things were not just random on the landscape, the orientations of these heiau. And archaeologists previously in, in Hawaii had, had never really recognized that. Even John F.G. Stokes, the, who I have great respect for, who made the model, by the way, here right in the middle of us, of Vahula heiau in 1909 after mapping it. But even Stokes, he said... Well, these things all, he said, you know, some of them seem to be oriented north and some are oriented east and west, but I don't think there's any really meaning to that or, or a system. And, well, I don't agree with Stokes. The data I have from Kaiki Nui show that these temples are laid out in very specific orientations. The, the most frequent to the east, this is a, a compass rose plot, and the, the longer the dark bands, the more heiau in that particular orientation. So... Um, so you can see most of them are oriented due east, but there's a, a significant number northeast, that's the rising position of Pleiades, and a significant number that are actually to the north. 
And when I made this diagram, it needs to be updated and corrected, I had just one that confused me that was a mirror image of the northeast until we realized that's the one where you sit in the little chamber, you're looking northeast, so it actually is oriented to the northeast as well. And there's nothing else. I mean, they're all either north, northeast, or east, right? And so um, I published an article about this. My interpretation is that the orientations are reflecting the different gods to which these Ea were, were dedicated. So that the east-facing ones are probably associated with Kane, who is associated with the rising sun and the path of the sun uh, you know, through the day. And those temples, those east-oriented, are also almost always associated with small, these intermittent water courses where waters would flow at certain times. So Kane is also the god of flowing waters. The ones that are oriented to the northeast, which is where Pleiades would rise, Makali'i, which is associated with Lono and the Makahiki, um, I think were temples to Lono, very important in this uh, dryland area. And the ones to the north, I suspect, are associated with Ku, because Ku is associated with high mountains, with forests, the Vawa Kua, with red, and they have those red Pu'u up on Haleakala, uh, and so on. So I think that what we see in these orientations is a reflection of the, uh, the different uh, priesthoods, the different um, worship of particular Akua. It's hard to prove that archaeologically, but I think the, um, it's, a, it's a very well-supported uh, set of hypotheses. And one of the things that we pioneered in Kahiki Nui, which my time, not too much longer, I'll be pow. Um, many of you know that archaeologists mostly have used radiocarbon dating of charcoal to do our chronologies in, in Hawaii and elsewhere. And radiocarbon dating is great. It's a wonderful tool, but it has a fairly big error margin. We get these plus minus factors of like, you know, nowadays we're down to maybe 30, 40 years, but that's still a lot. We got plus or minus. So maybe, you know, 80 year span. Uh, I discovered during the course of this project that some geology colleagues of mine at Berkeley had this method of dating corals with uranium thorium. And um, I had seen branch corals out on Heiau in Kaiki Nui, and I was thinking about maybe we could try to date those. And I was talking to these geologists, and you know, <clears throat> they said, why don't you use uranium thorium dating? I said, I thought that was for only old stuff like old reefs, you know, 400,000 years old. And I said, no, we can date to yesterday, and we can give it to you with plus or minus two years. I said, what? So we pioneered this, and we now have done a lot of dating. I mean, you only need small piece. We just cut out a little tiny piece of this. And uh, we have done extensive uranium thorium dating, which has allowed us to tie down the period of the construction of the temple system in Kaiki Nui. Now, this is still unpublished uh, data. So each um, bar like this is representing one date, and I put them here into 50-year time brackets, but they're much more precise than that. So you can see there's some activity back from the thousands and the 1300s, but Interestingly, 1550 to 1559, boom, tons of these things. And these are not just offerings on top of altars. These are corals that were placed sometimes inside walls. So we're dating construction. So what we did, we, of course, we don't want to go tear down walls. But we carefully find places where the walls collapse from cattle and so on. We take a little piece from inside. So there was a period, 150 years here, of, of major construction <coughs> from in the 1550s to the 1650s. Or, or end of uh, 1600s. And when I began thinking about this, what does this mean? Um, and again, I went back to the Mo'olelo, back to Kamakao, back to Fornander. And that was a time, if you take a 20 year period per generation and you use the genealogies of the Maui Ali'i, you find that that is the time that Maui, which formerly consisted of independent, separate small kingdoms or chiefdoms, West Maui, uh, East Maui, but was consolidated under the reign of Pi'ilani, the famous Pi'ilani, then his son Kiha Pi'ilani, who fought with his brother Lono Pi'ilani and, and won, and, uh, <coughs> and the grandson of Pi'ilani, who was uh, Kamalala Avalu, who was the first to try to attack uh, Big Island, of course, and no, not successful. but. The Mo'olelo make it very clear that all of Maui was consolidated into a real true kingdom during the reign of those reigns of those successive three ali'i, uh, who of course also extended their control over Lanai and Kaholawe, and probably to some extent parts of Moloka'i at the time as well. So what we also know now is that 
uh, when they did that, they were also encouraging the construction of heiau through these districts, which I think was part of the system of uh, the ahupua, the makahiki being formalized, the collection of hookupu through the temple system and so on. Uh, many people have asked me, how many people lived in Kaikinui? It's one of the first questions that you know, was put to me by some of the Ohana folks. And um, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And the only uh, data we have from the historic period come from the missionary census of 1831-32, when uh, throughout the islands was the first head count of, of people. And so the total for Kaikinui district at that time was 517, broken down like this. Kane, Wahine, Keiki Kane, Keiki Wahine, um, which is not a lot of people for a whole district of 20 some thousand acres. But this, of course, is 1831, 32, this is 50, 60 years after Cook, disease, you know, big depopulation, and so on. So, how do we go back to before that? Well, again, we can use the data from the Kauhale, from the house sites. We do a kind of census taking in archaeology. How many houses? We can estimate maybe six to eight people on average per house. But of course, we have to be able to date those houses. And so this is what we spend a lot of time doing, uh, these Kauhali clusters, going out, surveying them, counting how many on the land, and then getting radiocarbon dates from representative numbers. So in this whole area, I surveyed 544 structures, seemed to group into 117 Kauhali clusters. This is only you know, part of Kaikinui. Um, then we dated those. This was with radiocarbon dating, so we have these kind of dating bins. And through all of this, we build up a, a picture by time period of the probable number of complexes and people. And so we end up with <coughs> a projection that early on, uh, in terms of the density of people, was something like 10 to 14 people per square kilometer of area but built up to 50 or so persons per square kilometer in the late period. And that's a pretty high density for a dry land where it would be much higher in Oahu where you had lo'i and all of that. But for an aina malo, it's pretty amazing. Um, and there are implications of that. Some of you know there's been a big debate about how many people were in the islands as a whole. Right? We don't really know. Um, I mean, Captain, <coughs> um, sorry, on Cook's voyage, Lieutenant King estimated 400,000, but it was kind of you know, shooting from the hip. Um, but if my estimates for Kaiki Nui are right, there, there were between about two and 3,000 people for that district, and that would have been the lowest from anywhere in Maui, then it may be that Maui itself had as many as 200,000 people. I mean, we know Kaupo had uh, several times more than Kaiki Nui. So it raises interesting implications for the overall population of the <coughs> uh, Hawaiian Islands. And finally, this is the last uh, section I'll wrap up here. We also, in the course of this project, have generated a lot of it, information about what happened after uh, European contact. Uh, Cook, of course, um, he came off the windward coast of Maui, and then he was told about the Big Island of Hawaii, and so he sailed down there and, and met his eventual fate at Kealakekua, as you know. He, didn't really, he never landed on Maui. So it was the next voyager, though, the Frenchman <coughs> La Perouse, in May of 1786, he came, uh, and he'd had Cook's journals. He knew that. And he knew Cook had been to the Big Island. So he said, well, I'm going to go explore Maui. And he came down past Kaupo, past the Kaiki Nui coast. Uh, he describes it as this horrible lava wasteland. He's like, oh, my God, you know, why did I come here? But he mentions canoes, you know, chasing after him as he's going down the Alinui Ha Ha Channel. And he lands at Keoneo Io, La Perouse Bay, as we now call it and anchored there and had interactions uh, for a couple of days with the people, I think including the folks who were chasing him in canoes from, from Kahiki Nui. And we found this petroglyph is clearly a European square-rigged ship incised into the rock of one of these rock shelters. And it, when we did a test bit in there, we had some rusty pieces of barrel hoop, which were probably used to do that incising. And this is one of the things that Hawaiians early on wanted, these you know, the metal, the bands that go around barrels because you could, they could actually um, cut them and use them as adze blades, right? And so much sharper than the stone, you know? And we had one or two trade beads as well in this. So I don't know if this is La Perouse's uh, vessel or a slightly later trading vessel, but I like to think maybe it's La Perouse's, one of the guys who chased down La Perouse and came back and said, 
to his friends, like, you never believe, you know, what I saw it on there, you know, and these guys got all these barrel hoops, you know, and whatever. So, um, of course, <clears throat> slightly later then, uh, as many of you know here, uh, big changes occurred with the arrival um, of the Protestant missionaries right after Kahumanu and Lihuliho had um, <clears throat> uh, gotten rid of the Aikapu system. And Kahumanu, of course, adopted the Protestant church as her uh, main state religion, replacing the ancient uh, Heia worship. Um, but in Kahikinui, as I've mentioned, the people there became Catholics. It's very interesting. And there were a couple of important figures, Simeon Kauau and, and, um, <coughs> and Heli, uh, Heli Liloa, who both came and they were catechists and taught the Catholic faith. There's some very interesting evidence, not only San Inez Church, but a heo which has been, which was converted to a house site and occupied probably, I think, by Simeon Kahuau himself. Um, under Kahumanu, one of the first things that she did very early on was to order that schools be constructed in all of the districts around the islands. Uh, the missionaries, of course, were uh, interested in translating and printing the Bible, and they began to do this early on. Um, printing these primers called the uh, Piapa, and we found the schoolhouse in Kaikinui. There was a schoolhouse near the uh, trail, the double stone curb line trail that was built under Governor Hoapili in the 1830s with convict labor. So all the folks who um, ignored Kahomanu's blue laws, you know, that you can't drink, including Ava, like Ava was, you know, you weren't supposed to do that, but alcohol and, you know, adultery and all these things that you weren't supposed to do, uh, if you got arrested by the magistrates, then you had to go out and work and build these roadways. Uh, that's whole Pili's. But right next to the, whole, the roadway is this very precise rectangular structure, not a house site, not a scrap of midden near it, nothing. And I, I pondered this thing, and I pondered it, and we found in the middle, the only artifact we found in the middle was a brass cap from the base of a kerosene lantern and I imagine this little lantern hanging there and the people sitting on Lahala mats and learning from the Pia Pa and so on. Later, about six years later, in the archives, Holly McEldowney found the evidence that said right from some land claims that right there was the Holly Skula, so the schoolhouse, so it was confirmed in that. So here uh, we have other evidence of people learning, reading, writing in Kaikinui, this is the Piapa, the famous page from it, printed by the missionaries and distributed and would have been used in these schools with the alphabet. And here on rocks, um, we have you know, attempts at writing. And notice how they replicate the serifs on the letters, right? Which is the way that the you know, type was printed on the Piapa. So they, I mean, part of it was very important. You, know, you get the little things on the E and the A and all that. They were pecking this into the rock, which I find really fascinating. And this one, the guy... He's, you know, Keava, and he runs out of space. Goes around the back of the rock. That's what I mean. <laughs> Keava Kai. So it finishes the name, but it, you know, didn't space it out quite right to begin with. Um, and there were changes then in the Kauhali, in the form of houses. So the, the Kauhali cluster of separate, functionally separate houses um, changes to one of single dwellings. So we now have single room house sites. And in these we find, you know, trade beads and <coughs> ceramics and glass and all these artifacts from the middle of the 19th century. And other things, um, horses come in, so we have corrals, for example, stone line corrals, new kinds of, of architectural forms that never existed uh, previously. Um, so the population of Keikinui we know was declining, as I mentioned, in the Mahele of 1848-54, uh, um, the land of Kaikinui was initially given, well, Wanaupua Awahi was given to Princess Ruth, uh, who retained it. All the rest of Kaikinui was given to Prince Lot, who later was, um, became king. And he didn't like it. He didn't want the drylands of Kaikinui. So almost immediately, he got the Privy Council to exchange some other lands, and he gave his lands of Kaikinui as government land which is why it became Hawaiian homelands in 1920. So it was government land from the Mahele. Now, um, <coughs> we don't, interestingly, only one commoner, one Makainana, made a land claim, an LCA claim, in the Mahele, a guy named Makaole. We know there were people living there, but nobody else made claims, no Makainana. We don't know why exactly. 
But right after the Mahele, about 10 of those families made claims to the government to buy their land as royal patent uh, purchases. Some of you know about this complexities in Hawaiian land tenure. And so we've researched that, and we know the names of those families. So we know in the 1860s, there were at least 12 families trying to buy their land. And then in the 18, late 60s and 70s in the archives of Hawaii, we find this very interesting correspondence between the governor of Maui and the land agent and the minister of the interior in Honolulu. And they say, well, there's some people who want to lease the lands of Kaikinui for cattle ranching. So there's a, a Chinese guy named Li um, Ali, I think, or something like that. I forget his name. And he wants to lease it for $200 a year. And there's some Haole guy named, I forget what, Crockett or something like that. And he's going to give 250 And then there's a Portuguese guy named Pico, and, which gets Hawaiianized as Pico. And uh, we've done a lot of research on, on him. And it turns out he was actually on Oahu, um, but for a while was on Maui. Anyway, Paiko, long story short, gets the lease in 1872. Even though the Kahikinui people had written to the Minister of Interior and said, we would like to lease it. Don't give it to the Haole. Give it to us. We want to form a Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian cattle ranching organization. We'll lease it. And we have these interesting uh, correspondence. And you could tell the, the one, the governor of Maui is very torn by this. And he's, you know, would like to give it to the local people. But in the end, it's politics. And it went to uh, Mr. Pico, who very soon had more than 2,000 head of cattle running over this. Well, you can imagine you can't have your Uwala fields and your Piligras house sites with 2,000 head of cattle running over it. And this place I'm showing you here is uh, where the last people in Kaikinui apparently tried to hold out. A place called Uli Uli, very remote, uh, down at Kahawai Hapapa Point. And right up here is a detail of it. Uh, is the platform on which Mr. Pico had his windmill and pump going down into a lava tube that's somewhere around here where there's sweet water, the Vaya um, Ilio, the water of the dog. He pumped up into two troughs that are stone and coral lime mortar here to feed his peepee, his cattle. So you can imagine 2,000 head of cattle coming down to be watered here and the village, Uli Uli, these are house sites, they threw up this wall um, probably like in a couple of days because it's, it's only like one pohaku wide, you know, so it's got all these pukas you can see through. Um, like desperately trying to keep the cattle outside of their village. Well, the cattle would actually come and eat the thatch, surely, right off the houses, you know. Um, so, and when Walker came through in 1930, Winslow Walker, he was told that this was the place where the last people had been and abandoned it about 30 years before him. So right around the turn of the century, the last folks left Kahikinui, apparently for Kaupo, um, to be abandoned. So the later history then of the, most of the 20th century, the late 19th century from 1872 on, becomes one of cattle ranching. Um, uh, Pico himself uh, didn't spend much time there, but he partnered with a guy named Enos, who then partnered with Ferreira, and those two Portuguese, uh, Paniolo, uh, did a lot of ranching. They had Kahikinui Ranch, built this, oops, I'm sorry, bunkhouse, um, Kahikinui House, as it's called. Around 1915 or so, the wood was apparently landed at Nu'u and taken up by ox cart, and uh, that was still, it's barely standing now, it's really falling down. This is a picture I found, 1927 ranching, Kahikinui Ranching. Um, but of course today, um, Kauhana Okaikinui has gotten their leases from Hawaiian homes, so people are back, Native Hawaiians are back on the Aina. Um, and what the future will be, I don't know, but I have some speculations in my book you can read. So for me, it's been a long and interesting intellectual and, and physical journey out there on the Aina from a 16-year-old kid here with Peter Chapman, and then a long hiatus, and then picking up in 1995 and working in Kahikinui all these many years. I know much of this landscape like the back of my hand, I can tell you, and I can show you the lantana scratches and the bum knee and everything from <clears throat> years of walking over this land for it. I want to um, you know, thank some of the organizations in particular that have supported the work, uh, major funding from the National Science Foundation over the years, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands for giving us permission uh, to do all this work out there, 
Kauhana Okaiki Nui for <coughs> being such wonderful friends and supporters, State Historic Preservation Division also helping in various ways. And at one point we had some grant money from the National Geographic Society as well, and many, many individuals. I won't name them all, but um, this kind of work involves the, the koku of <coughs> lots and lots of people who I'm very grateful to. Uh, so mahalo nui loa to all of you for coming out tonight and uh, listening, and I, I hope it's been uh, <coughs> an interesting story. Mahalo. I can, I can take a couple of questions. So I've got to have a sip of water, though, because my voice is getting really dry. So you're asking if the Kane and the Kuhea were built at the same time or used at the same time. Yeah. So what our evidence uh, indicates is that, as I said, there was a major period of Heiau construction. It begins in the late 1600s and goes in... Um, then into the six, well, excuse me, late 1500s into the 1600s, uh, and the forms of temple that are east oriented, which I think are Kane associate, and those that are Pleiades oriented, and the north ones are all being constructed. So, what's very interesting is that the forms of the Heiau, these um, notched and elongated and so on, they don't correlate one to one with the orientations. So, we, we have several forms. But those aren't, I think, what's indicating the function in terms of the gods. It's the orientations that I think are you know, indicating the, the functions. But both the, the forms, the variation forms, and the orientations go across that whole time period. So it's not like there's one first, then another one, then another one. Yeah, that, um, <clears throat> I don't want to be quoted on this because it's kind of controversial, but... I'm just tell what I'm saying is that um, if we take we we work really hard to estimate the Kaikinui population, so a lot of data, a lot of parameters there. I feel pretty comfortable about the population you know I have there. If I take that, so two to three thousand people in Kaikinui before contact. At 1831, we have 500. It's reduced to 500. If you use those same ratios, if the reduction was the same, then for the island of Maui, what I'm saying is if you take the 1831 population and the same you know, ratio to the pre-contact in Kaikinui, you'd come up with around 200,000. So you'd have to figure it out for yourself you know, for Oahu and Kauai and so on. But it's not the 400,000 that people quote from King. It's much greater than that. Well, I don't want to put a number on it. But it would certainly be, for the archipelago, more than 400,000, a lot more. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to say a number here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, the place, I have an appendix in the back of my book, which is a, a gazetteer of all known place names, so if you're interested, because I thought that was worth doing, including the names that are being invented now by Kauhana, which is really interesting, because I wanted to get them recorded. So, you know, Mo Moeller has, a, well, I'll just give you an example. There was a place that they used to call, when I first went out there, they called it Lumberyard, Little Cove, because all this driftwood would float in and pile up. And then somebody came in a little boat and led a fire to Lumberyard, and they went down there, and the fire was so hot, it was a lot of driftwood, that the pohakus were busting and flying apart. So then they started calling it pohakulele. So everybody calls it pohakulele now. So I wanted to document that pohakulele is a name that dates to like 1999 <laughs> by Mo Moller and the Kauhana. Okay. But back to your question. The problem is because Kaiki Nui was abandoned in the late 19th century, um, very few names were, were recorded. I, get, I got everything I could off of those few land claims, uh, off early maps, every early map I could. But, you know, the list is, is you know, only probably just the tip of the iceberg what would have existed. So Sam Poe, who was this old Paniolo cowboy in Kanayo when we were there in 66, was interviewed by uh, Peter Chapman and I think Ellie Williamson and, and maybe Kavana Pukui also interviewed him. He knew Kanayo next door and he had like a hundred place names along the coast for Kanaya. But when we got to Kaiki Nui, he just knew a few, you know. He said, that's not my Aina, I don't really know it. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things, I'm afraid it's lost, most of it. But I've tried to pull together. And it, like you say, I mean, it, some of them obviously were named probably for some event. Some people, some descriptive, some we cannot really translate. But, it's an, but anyway, if you want, the book has a list of all those names. 
Maybe <coughs> one more if somebody. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> at that uh, priest house that I was talking about, in a, a little concentration in the floor when we were excavating there, we found, and I don't, sorry that I can't tell you off the top of my head the exact numbers. Um, I don't know if I put it in the book or not, but if not, we have the, the data. So there were black and white. They're, they're about this size. They're perfect size for konane. Uh, pebbles, right? And they may have been Konane, for the game Konane. But in Kamakau, uh, I think in Kapoi Kahiko, he talks about also how certain priests, Kahuna Lapa'au, medicinal practitioners, used black and white rounded pebbles in um, diagnosis of disease. They would lay them over the body, and I don't know how they did it, but so I am wondering if this wasn't in fact uh, his set of pebbles for that practice. And they were all concentrated together. I think they were probably in a lauhala or some kind of little kit bag, and that doesn't preserve, you know, that, that rots over time. But they're all clustered together. There were over 100. I, I could give you the precise numbers um, from my notes. Yes? Yeah, I think I <clears throat> understand what you're saying. So when the... But he's asking... Uh, the people living there now, these Native Hawaiians who have their leases, and... You're asking how they can protect the sites, is that what I understand? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the, how, how the housing should be located. So, so when the Hawaiian Homes um, Department was uh, considering and finally agreeing to Kauhana's uh, demands to have leases, these are 20 acre uh, leases, I think, uh, they, they actually contracted with. Uh, Archaeologists work for the State Historic Preservation Division, Boyd Dixon and others. So all of the area that was put into leases was actually archaeologically surveyed, not by me, but by, by you know, this other archaeological team. And the leases, I believe, all have covenants um, with maps that show the locations, and the, they are supposed to leave the sites protected and not disturb them. Um, and I know most of the Kauhana folks that we work with want to do that. They very much want to malama. Uh, protect, take care of the sites, and, and uh, preserve them. Most of the area that is, uh, the really concentration of sites is Heiau and so on, is outside of the area that has been uh, designated for re reoccupation. Uh, I will say that my bigger concern is not with <coughs> the Kauhana uh, people who've gone back to Kaikinui. It's with other possible land uses that have been talked about in recent years. And so at the end of my book, I talk about the future of Kaiki Nui. I mean, I'm an archaeologist. I look at the past. It's not my job to say what the future will be, but I couldn't avoid making some comments because in just the last couple of years, uh, wind farms have... Well, the big wind farm has gone in at Awahi on Ulapalakua Ranch land. I think in the end it was six or eight big wind farms. But I know that the Hawaiian Homes Department has had hearings and talked about as many as, I think, 45 big wind turbines in Kaikinui. And that, you know, cannot be done without major impact on archaeological sites, on landscape, and so on. And, and it's not my job to say, you know, yes or no, but I, it is my job to point out there are sites there, and they have to be considered. And I end the book actually by saying, I think that you know, so wind energy is a resource, you can say, and so on. But there's a much bigger resource to me of Kaikinui, and it's as an educational resource. It's a huge educational resource out there that is not being looked at. Hawaiian Homelands, I don't think, you know, has thought of it that way, and they ought to be thinking about it that way, to educate the Keiki, to educate, you know, people about land, about how people malamed it, lived on it, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it's not... Uh, Kamehameha School's Bishop of State land, but it actually was Kamehameha land because it was Princess Ruth's and it was Prince Lot's. And, you know, I dared to suggest, I don't know if they'll pick up on this or not, but I would love to see KSBE partner with Hawaiian Homes. They have a campus on Maui, but they don't have much land, but they could use Kahiki Nui as a major educational uh, place. So I, I put that suggestion out there, and we'll see whether anybody reacts to it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, th yeah, those are big, complicated questions. There'll be a whole another lecture on that. But I uh, asking about the agriculture and both the rainfall and the soil. I, I'm not going to get into the second one. I've actually we've published a whole another book on it. I can give you a reference to about nutrients. But for the rainfall, those records that I showed you are like they're 20th century records, and it's true there would be periods. And I've seen periods out there during my work, two droughts, when it was almost impossible to grow anything under current conditions for a year or two. And you would probably have to have moved out temporarily or traded with folks for some food or something. But I'm not sure it was as harsh as that pre-contact, both because lots of evidence that the forest came down much, much lower. There are still big old standing koa and ohia uh, stumps, you know, down to 2,500 feet above sea level and so on. So I think with uh, under conditions where the forest came down much lower before cattle, um, you would have had much more fog drip capture and precipitation. And uh, th that would probably have made a big difference uh, in growing walla and water table and so on. But there could have been still from time to time a significant drought that you know, might have caused people to have to move with other relatives. I, I don't know. But it, it was a tough place to, to work, uh, to, to grow crops for sure. Somebody in the back, yes. Firewood? Yeah, we've actually identified something we do now whenever we radiocarbon date. We can identify the wood, the charcoal. We, I had a doctoral student who built up a big reference collection of Hawaiian woods carbonized. So, um, <clears throat> and off the top of my head, I, you know, I can't tell you all the species, but. They were primarily the dryland um, species of, uh, but not so much big trees, but more shrubby kind of stuff like aali'i and akoko and, and that, you know, smaller, but wiry, dry, shrubby things that we find quite a lot of. But firewood, too, would have been somewhat limiting. I think that's why they weren't making emus every day. You know, they were carefully reheating food of small haras because uh, the dryland forest doesn't grow as fast and lushly and so on as, as the wet. Maybe one more question, and then my voice is going to give up. Used. Oh, so he's asking about the lua. Yeah, where they went, everybody went to the lua. Which, you know, it's something we have pondered and talked about. Um, and, well, it might relate to the other gentleman's question about nutrients in fields. <laughs> because you're not going to go, you know, traditionally, so I've done a lot of field work, as Victoria mentioned, in, in the South Pacific on smaller islands, where people live mostly on the coast. Atikopia and in, in Neotopatapu and Futuna, these places I worked early on in my career. And there, in these Polynesian cultures, they all tend to go in the ocean. You just go at low tide out on the reef flat, and that's the lua. Everybody goes there. But in Kaikinui, there's cliff, there's 50 foot cliffs down. Th and anyway, you're not going to walk for two hours, you know, <laughs> to go to the lua and walk back up to your garden. So they must have been going out there on the land. And it would actually make sense from an ecological point of view in nutrients if they actually did what other traditional peoples do in China and so on and used uh, the kukai, you know, the night soil, as fertilizer in fields. But I don't have any evidence that, that, you know, that's, that they were doing that. There are some ways you might be able to get at that actually through some kinds of <coughs> analyses of... Um, amino acids and things like this in soils. I don't know, but we haven't gotten there. But it's a hell of a good question. <laughs> Mahalo for listening. If you have any questions or comments on this or other online audio programs, please visit us online at www.bishopmuseum.org. If you like us on Facebook, you'll be alerted when new programs are available. Ahui ho from the Bishop Museum.